welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in listening-only mode into the question and answer session of today's conference. At that time, you may press star 1 on your phone to ask a question. I would like to inform all parties that today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the conference over to Stephanie Sherholtz. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Sherholtz for NASA's Office of Communications. Thank you for joining today's teleconference. This afternoon, NASA announced the agency has signed agreements to develop early concepts and uh, designs of commercial space stations. These concepts are for free-flying, commercially owned and operated destinations in low Earth orbit that will advance NASA's goal for continuous presence in low Earth orbit by transitioning from the International Space Station to a commercial model. And this will also serve as part of the foundation of a robust U.S.-led commercial economy in low Earth orbit. This teleconference will host a panel of representatives from NASA and the awarded companies to provide comments and answer questions from the media. Joining our panel today is Phil McAllister, the Director of Commercial Space Flight at NASA Headquarters in Washington. Angela Hart, the Manager of NASA's Commercial Low Earth Orbit Development Program at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. Brent Sherwood, Senior Vice President of Advanced Development Program at Blue Origin and Dr. Janet Cavandi, former NASA astronaut and Sierra Space President. Jeffrey Manber, President of International and Space Stations for Voyager Space and Chairman of the Board at NanoRack. And Rick Mastracchio, Director of Business Development for Human Exploration at Northrop Grumman. We'll first start with some opening comments from each of our briefers before taking questions. Questions will come in on our phone bridge as well as social media platforms. If you're on the phone, please press star one to add your name to our queue and ask a question. If you're on social media, use the hashtag AskNASA. We'll now begin with initial remarks from Phil McAllister. Thanks, Stephanie, and thanks to all the members of the media participating in today's teleconference and everyone else who's listening and following these new developments in commercial spaceflight. Um, welcome. Uh, the Commercial Low Earth Orbit Destination Awards NASA is announcing today mark an exciting new chapter in the development of the LEO economy. These awards will help ensure the United States has a continuous human presence in LEO as required by the U.S. National Space Policy and the NASA Transition Authorization Act of 2017. And they will also help ensure our astronauts will continue to have access to the LEO environment to do critical science and microgravity and advance human, human space exploration after the retirement of the International Space Station. <clears throat> NASA was very pleased to have received 11 proposals to our announcement, which was a tremendous number. Uh, almost all of the proposals represented viable concepts for commercial LEO destinations. While we selected the best companies based on our evaluation criteria, we encouraged the non-selected companies to continue to develop their concepts. The next chapter in our commercial LEO efforts is planned to be a full and open competition in the mid part of this decade for certification of the systems and for NASA's purchase of destination services. That procurement is likely to represent a very, very sizable financial commitment on the part of NASA. <clears throat> so uh, the envelope, please. Uh, this is not very dramatic because I'm sure you guys have already read the award announcement, uh, but the awardees of NASA's commercial Leo destination agreements are in alphabetical order. Blue Origin of Kent, Washington, along with Sierra Space for their orbital reef destination in the amount of $130 million. NanoRacks of Houston, Texas for their Star Lab destination in collaboration with Voyager Space and Lockheed Martin in the amount of $160 million. And Northrop Grumman Systems of Dulles, Virginia for their commercial LEO destinations concept in the amount of $125.6 million. <clears throat> So congratulations, Blue Origin, Nanorax, and Northrop Grumman, and all of their partners. I also want to congratulate and sincerely thank each NASA employee who contributed to the evaluation. These individuals completed a tremendous amount of work in a relatively short period of time, 
and they did a really excellent job and made my my uh, decision a lot easier by all the work that they put in. So thank you. <clears throat> so each company will give you more details about their specific concepts in a moment, but I just wanted to say a few words about the overall portfolio uh, that we now have. <clears throat> First, we have a very diverse group of companies in terms of age, size, and business strategy. I think this diversity will make NASA's strategy for commercial destinations very robust, and it will ensure a healthy competition in the days ahead for safe, reliable, and cost-effective commercial LEO destinations. Second, we have a diverse set of technical concepts, including inflatable modules, metallic structures, and a combination of inflatable and metallics. There are a variety of launch vehicles and logistics systems planned by the companies, leveraging NASA's prior investments in crew and cargo transportation. This diversity not only enhances the likelihood of success of NASA's strategy, but it also leads to a high degree of innovation, which is critical in most commercial space endeavors. So I talked a little bit about the diversity, but there are some aspects that were consistent among the proposals. All three companies proposed testing or hardware demonstrations as part of their agreements. I'm a strong believer in tests. Uh, design reviews are important as they allow the NASA team to understand the system design and operation, but actual hardware testing where you can observe how the hardware perform performs is a clear measure of progress and quality. And the testing buys down risk. So I was very pleased to see uh, each one of these companies including that in their agreements. Also, all the companies proposed an initial operating capability of their systems prior to 2030. If the International Space Station is extended to 2030, this will provide some schedule margin for the overall system development and ensure that we don't have a gap in our access to low Earth um, or orbit. Finally, NASA encouraged bidders to maximize their financial contribution to these activities. The combined percentage of non-NASA investment is over 60%, with NASA's contribution under 40%. Clearly, these companies believe in the LEO economy and the non-government market for destination services. NASA believes in this as well, which should make for strong partnerships going forward. I should also point out that we should keep in mind that NASA is also funding Axiom Spaces concept for a commercial LEO destination. We awarded that contract to Axiom last year with a maximum contract value of $140 million. Axiom strategy is to initially attach multiple modules to the International Space Station and then detach to operate as a free-flying platform. And the company is very busy maturing its concept and completing its contractual milestones. Uh, the concepts that we are awarding today are all planned to go directly to orbit as free-flying destinations. Um, so to sort of clarify what we're calling all these things, um, the Axiom contract is called the Commercial Destination ISS, or CDISS. And the awards today are called Commercial Destination Free Flyer, or CDFF. All four are part of NASA's Commercial LEO Destinations effort. Taken together, these four companies provide a solid footing for NASA's strategy. I am very confident that one or more of these concepts will be successful and we'll eventually be providing commercial LEO destination services to NASA and to other customers for many years to come. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Phil. Uh, thanks for those opening remarks. And now we will pass it over to Angela Hart, manager of this program. Good afternoon. And thank you so much for being here today. Today is another critical step as NASA continues to support the development of a robust and sustainable commercial LEO economy. The awards today represent NASA's investment and enabling of these commercial free-flying destinations or commercial orbiting stations that will allow NASA to meet our needs as an agency and ensure a seamless transition of activities from the International Space Station. As noted in the past, we estimate that our agency's future needs in low Earth orbit will require accommodations and training for at least two crew members continuously and the ability to perform approximately 200 investigations annually to support human research, technology demonstrations, biological and physical science, and a national lab, and, and all the national lab needs. We have a two-phase strategy that builds on the successful legacy of our commercial cargo and commercial crew programs that now are de delivering important research, supplies, and astronauts to the International Space Station. 
The strategy will provide services the government needs at a lower cost, enable the agency to focus on its Artemis missions to the moon and onto Mars, while continuing to use low Earth orbit as a training and proving ground for our deep space mission. In the first phase, as still stated, we are pursuing multiple funded space act agreements for early concept development of commercial destinations. Phase one will take us into 2025 timeframe. And in the second phase, NASA intends to certify commercial LEO destinations and purchase destination services via a FAR-based acquisition contract when services become available prior to the retirement of the space station. The goal of my office is to implement this two-phase strategy and ensure that we work closely with the companies during their formulation and design phases in preparation for awarding services to at least one commercial station capable of providing NASA, our international partners, and other youth government agencies a platform to continue our presence and work in lower orbit. In parallel to the Phase One Space Act agreements and the Axiom contract, we will be finalizing our safety certification and service requirements for NASA crew visitation to a commercial destination that will need to be met by proposers as part of the services contract phase. Phase two is targeted to begin in 2026, allowing time for human rating and certification process with the goal to have no gap in the U.S. continuous presence in space that we've, now, that we've had now for more than 21 years. We plan to release our draft service and crew requirements next year. This strategy allows NASA to develop requirements for commercial low Earth orbit destinations in parallel with our commercial partners' development. As we jointly work and learn with these new partners and continue to work with Axiom Space, we will ensure a safe but innovative solution for new platforms in LEO. Again, we are extremely excited to make these awards today to the Orbital Reef Team led by Blue Origin, with Sierra Space, to Nanoracks in collaboration with Voyager Space and Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman. My team is ready and we look forward to working with each of these companies and their teams closely over the coming years. Thank you and congratulations to everyone. Thank you, Angela. Okay, so now let's hear from the companies. First, we will have the Orbital Reef team with Brent Sherwood, Senior Vice President of Advanced Development Programs at Blue Origin and Dr. Janet Cavandi uh, at Sierra Space. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, today's a great day for the agency and for competitive commercial space business. Uh, Blue Origin and Sierra Space have partnered to develop Orbital Reef, a commercially owned and operated low Earth orbit space station. Our teammates are on the line with us today, Boeing, Redwire Space, Genesis Engineering Solutions, and Arizona State University. Our whole team's grateful for NASA's contributions to the design of Orbital Reef and its revolutionary approach to making Earth orbit accessible to more diverse customers and industries. Orbital Reef is a mixed-use space business park that will offer reduced costs and complexity, turnkey services, and inspiring space architecture to support any business. In addition to meeting the International Space Station partners' needs, will develop new commercial markets that stimulate a growing space economy even before the West's only space station is decommissioned. Shared infrastructure allows us to efficiently support the diverse and proprietary needs of users, tenants, and visitors, research, industrial, and personal, government, commercial, and global. Accommodations, vehicle docking ports, and utilities all scale as market demand grows. Our human-centered space architecture with big volumes, big hatches, big windows, world-class amenities, advanced robotics, and the single-person spacecraft is inspiring, practical, and safe. Reusable space transportation and smart design, accompanied by advanced automation and logistics, will minimize cost and complexity for both traditional space operators and new arrivals, allowing the widest range of users to pursue their goals. Orbital Reef will reach baseline configuration, which you see in the NASA press release, in the second half of this decade. With that, I'll introduce Janet Cavandi, President of Sierra Space. Thank you, Brent. Sierra Space is very honored to be selected alongside our partner, Blue Origin, and all of our talented and experienced team members. We plan to combine the best 
that we each bring to create a truly unique and creative approach to the next generation space station. Sierra Space will provide a large integrated flexible environment or life to orbital reefs. This large module will provide ample habitable volume, saving significant launch costs in creating orbit, on orbit living and working spaces. We will also provide transportation for both crew and cargo to the orbital reef by the use of our Dream Chaser space plane. We intend to continue NASA's relationships with international partners and offer opportunities for existing and future countries to participate in orbital reef. Due to the flexibility of a space, of a space plane, we can also bring crew and cargo back to commercial runways worldwide. We are also able to offer research capabilities and safe transportation back to Earth for delicate payloads and research that has been on the hiatus since the shuttle program ended a decade ago. Mr. Neeraj Gupta, General Manager for Space Destinations, will lead our orbital reef efforts at Sierra Space. On behalf of CEO Tom Weiss, our owners Aaron and Fadi Osman, and all of our new investor partners, Thank you for this opportunity to share with you our collective vision and future in low Earth orbit. Great, thank you both. Sounds exciting. Okay, now on to Jeffrey Manver, President of International and Space Stations for Voyager Space and Chairman of the Board at NanoRack. Hey, thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, and I'm speaking on behalf of everyone at Nanorax, uh, Voyager Space, Lockheed, and our team. Uh, we want to thank everyone at NASA and Congress and the administration uh, for believing in this new era of commercial, privately owned space stations. Uh, this is something that we know is critical for American leadership. Uh, and it's a, a also critical to make sure there is no space station gap as we retire the International Space Station. Uh, so it's an extremely important day for the community, for the industry, and for the nation. Uh, also joining me on the call is uh, Kirk Scheiman, uh, the Vice President of Lunar Exploration and former uh, head of the uh, space station program from Lockheed, uh, if, the, if you guys in the press have any technical uh, questions. Um, so, uh, drum roll, please. Let me tell you about the Star Lab. Uh, it's, uh, the core is inflatable. As Phil mentioned, uh, we're one of the teams putting in an um, inflatable uh, module habitat, plus it has a metallic node plus the uh, bus. What's really, really important to us is that the payload capac uh, capability is equivalent to the ISS at 22 uh, meters cubed. Uh, we're looking at a 2027 uh, launch and what is also really exciting to me was important to us as a team, uh, we're looking at reaching uh, initial full capacity in one launch. Um, it's continuously crewed by four astronauts, uh, and the uh, core of the concept of Star Lab is to be as sustainable a business model as possible. And uh, with that, uh, you know, we were very proud uh, previously to introduce the George Washington Carver Science Park, uh, which is the world's first ever science park. It's currently operating on the International Space Station, and it will be transitioning uh, onto the uh, Star Lab. And that's an important point that I do want to raise. Uh, NASA has been very clear, Congress has been very clear, that they want a sustainable, as sustainable a business model uh, as possible. And with Nanorax, we bring two decades of understanding and leading and utilization in low Earth orbit and on the International Space Station. And, um, and, and you know, that is something that's extremely important to me uh, and also making sure we have continuity uh, with our current ISS partners and we have a seamless transition from the ISS into the new era of private uh, space stations. Um, one, one final comment, uh, if I may. Um, we don't see coming out of this one winner. Uh, what we see coming out of this is at the end of this decade, there will be multiple uh, privately owned space stations. Maybe they're in differing orbits, uh, which would certainly strengthen the ecosystem and strengthen the space transportation system. Maybe there will be multiple platforms focused on different market niches. 
And so this is really the beginning of what's a game changer. We've had a decade of uh, the United States government and industry focused on space transportation, and now we're entering a new era of uh, destinations, and we could not, all of us, at Manorats, Voyager, Lockheed, and the whole Star Lab team be more excited. So with that, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. And next, we'll hear from Rick Mastracchio, who is also a former NASA astronaut and Director of Business Development for Human Exploration at Northrop Grumman. Over to you, Rick. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, first, let me say congratulations to the NanoRex and the Blue Origin teams. Uh, they sound like they got some exciting programs going on. And of course, thank you to NASA for working with us on this forward-looking program. On behalf of Northrop Grumman and our partners, we are excited be part of the next step in the commercialization of space. Our Cigna spacecraft has been providing the International Space Station commercial cargo services since 2013. So we see this as just one of the next steps for our Northrop Grumman human space exploration team. Uh, our Northrop Grumman commercial space station design uses the current flight system, such as our Cigna spacecraft, a mission extension vehicle, as well as the habitation and logistics outpost, a HALO module which is currently in design and production for NASA's Gateway. This allows for low risk, rapid deployment, but we're also going to design in expansion and growth capability to meet the growing needs of the future space economy. So our first element provides the facilities, the infrastructure capable of supporting four crew members with one launch, which minimizes our time to operations. And once that element one is on orbit, we quickly follow up with the cargo and crew vehicles to begin full-time operations. So we could initially support four permanent crew members with plans to extend to eight person crew, and then even further capability beyond that, again, as the market supports it. And the station is designed for a permanent presence of 15 years. We're gonna utilize an overlapping stage approach. It sounds very similar to what a lot of uh, the other folks are, are thinking. It minimizes initial costs and gets the revenue stream uh, flowing as early as possible to offset subsequent development in uh, the following modules. We'll have multiple docking ports to allow future modules and capabilities to be added, again, in conjunction with and according to the market needs. We could launch element one early enough to, easily early enough to enable a smooth transition from the International Space Station and, and then all the base, uh, the ISS-based LEO missions in transition over to our commercial space station. Uh, to support this effort, Northrop Grumman is building a team with some key expertise, which right now includes Dynetics, who brings some incredible experience to the team, and we anticipate we'll be announcing others in the uh, upcoming months. So that's all from, from me. I'd like just again to say thank you to NASA for the partnership, and, and we are looking forward to continuing to build the future of commercial space in LEO and beyond. Thank you. Great, thank you. And uh, now we will go over to questions. Now that we have com completed our opening remarks, as a reminder, if you're on the phone bridge, please press star one to submit a question. Uh, once your name and affiliation is called, please do state to whom you'd like to direct your question, since we have so many folks on the line. And if you find that your question has already been answered by the time we get to you, you can press star two to withdraw it. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with questions. The first question goes to Jeff Faust of Space News. Hey, good afternoon. A question probably for Phil or Angela. Uh, the Inspector General report earlier this week about ISS and commercial space stations expressed some skepticism about the schedules that you're talking about. Um, it said specifically that it believed a commercial platform is not likely to be ready until after 2030. Um, what gives you the, the confidence looking at these proposals and, and your own experience to believe that you will have uh, one or more commercial stations by the late 2020s to enable that smooth transition from the ISS? Well, I'll, I'll start off, but then I'm going to let each one of the companies talk about their readiness uh, to support um, our desire not to have a gap uh, and to transition from the ISS by 2030. But with respect to the OIG report, um, I agreed with it. A gap, what they said primarily is a gap in U.S. human presence in LEO would be disastrous for the LEO economy. 
and it would hamper NASA's ability to perform the research that we need to perform in LEO after the retirement of the ISS. That's one of our talking points, actually, uh, is that a gap would be bad, and that is exactly why we're making these awards today, to help ensure that there is no gap. Um, they also cited a bunch of challenges in there. Um, I agreed with all of those challenges, and again, I think these awards today uh, either address or significantly mitigate almost all of the challenges identified in the OIG report. So um, uh, I agree with the report, and I think if there was anything that we could do today that would um, increase our confidence, it's exactly what we've done, which is uh, expand the capabilities and expand the competitive landscape uh, so that we could eventually be successful prior to the deorbit or, or the retirement of the ISS. But uh, I'll let each one of the companies talk about their readiness of their concepts. So, uh, so this is um, this is Brent at Blue Origin. So uh, I'll, I'll go first. Um, we're going in the in the same order we went at the beginning. In case you guys are wondering. Um, and so I just say two quick things. One is uh, with respect to um, calendar feasibility, it's very important that we all work on um, sustaining and growing stakeholder support for what NASA is trying to do. Um, and so that means at OMB, it means on the Hill, um, it is uh, critically important that the West not lose its foothold in, uh, in LEO and have a gap, as Phil said. Um, with respect to technical readiness, I would simply say that um, there are two pieces to an end-to-end -end service. There's transportation and destination. Um, all of our transportation elements uh, will be flying over the next few years. Um, they've all been deep in development for years. And with respect to the destination systems, uh, we're building already. I'll stop there. Hey, this is Jeff Manber. Um, I, you know, I can't believe that a decade after uh, commercial cargo was launched, uh, folks are still questioning the robustness and uh, ingenuity and flexibility of the commercial pathway. So, um, sure, there are challenges going forward, but as Phil said, um, who had experience in commercial cargo, uh, that, you know, we have a robustness, we have multiplicity of providers working this, uh, and so this is exactly the right way to go forward on risk mitigation, um, to have multiple providers on the commercial pathway. So that's sort of a macro answer for I, the confidence that uh, I have on uh, the uh, all of the uh, folks chosen today, but on a more technical level, let me turn it over to my colleague uh, Kirk Scheiman. Kirk, um, can you just maybe dig in a little bit on the technical aspects? You bet. Uh, first, I'd like to say I agree completely with Phil um, uh, that uh, you know the fact that uh, there might be a gap is a reason for starting immediately, not a reason for. We're not starting, so uh, really happy that we had this announcement today that we're moving forward. Again, technically, the, the technologies, the uh, the uh, equipment, the habitats um, that we that we are using for Starlab are uh, under development today. So, um, yes, if you if you had nothing at all and you fired the starting pistol, uh, it's it's a big challenge. But all these things are uh, are currently in development today. Um, we're leveraging the experience that uh, that, that Nanorax um, and that Lockheed Martin have to uh, to go and build this and this space station, and I, I believe it's certainly feasible to uh, meet the schedule that we've laid out in our uh, agreement with NASA. And like uh, Brent said today, um, the, the really cool thing about uh, commercialization of space is is you can go buy some services uh, to transport transport things today. So uh, they exist today, and there'll be more in the future and we're looking forward to leveraging those capabilities. Thank you. Okay, Rick Mastracchio, Northrop Grumman. So, yeah, I'll have to echo a lot of what has already been said, but our plan is to leverage, you know, the operational hardware that we currently are operating and hardware that is currently under production, such as the HALO habitat. It, it really lowers the technical risk. The other part of that is in our, our design, it starts relatively small with a lot of growth potential built into it, and that allows us to get something up early and then also grow it as the market uh, shows uh, that it's responding to uh, what we have built. Thanks.
And I'll just uh, say one closing remark. Again, Jeff, don't forget Axiom. Axiom's been working for about two years now on their concept. So uh, to echo what a lot of people said, we're not starting from scratch. A lot of the partners that we announced today had some experience with our next step proposals and they were able, or next step agreements uh, that NASA's had for several years. So again, not starting from scratch uh, and certainly Axiom is, is well, in, um, well into their development phase. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for that comprehensive response. Our next question comes from Elizabeth Powell for space.com. Hi, thanks for taking my call. This is probably for Phil. Can you also bring us up to date on how the negotiations are going for a possible extension of the International Space Station's uh, international agreement past 2024? Yeah, that's a great question. I've got my colleague, Robin Gatins, who is the director of the ISS program at NASA headquarters uh, on the call, and I'll defer that to her. Hi, uh, yes, everyone. Um, so we've been discussing ISS extension with our stakeholders, both in the administration and in Congress. And I can say that, you know, they are supportive. They recognize that both ISS extension and enabling these new commercial space stations are needed to avoid a gap in LEO, and that's, uh, that's very important uh, to all of our stakeholders. I can't tell you today when a formal announcement will be made. That's uh, kind of in their hands, but I, I can tell you we have strong support. Thank you, Robin. Next question comes from Eric Berger of Ars Technica. Uh, good afternoon and <clears throat> congratulations to everyone on, on the awards. Uh, first question is for Phil. Um, you know, of these awards, you know, Phil, how much is actually funded by Congress? And I know I think Brent mentioned the fact that you need to work with stakeholders, but, you know, it, it seems like there's a lot of money here and, and so far there's not a whole lot of money in the budget for commercial EO destinations from Congress. And then question for the company representatives, to the extent you're willing, could you provide a rough order of the magnitude of cost for the initial configuration of your facilities. Thanks very much. Eric, so with respect to the first part of your question, uh, let me just be clear that we are going to follow all congressional direction regarding COMLEO destinations. To fully fund these awards, we do require the budget that was in the President's FY21 budget request. Um, however, should we fail to receive those appropriations in FY22, um, we could rephase some of the milestones to accommodate reduced levels of funding. I hope not to have to do that, uh, but if we get the President's full budget request, we should be fine. Um, and we should also be able to fund these initial activities uh, while we're under the current continuing resolution. We've looked at that very carefully. Um, I just saw in the press today that the CR might get extended to mid-February. We should still be fine, uh, even if that's the case. If we got a full year CR, um, that's, that's on the top of my Santa wish list as to what not to have, is not to have a full year CR. Uh, but if we did have that, we would obviously have to do some replanning, uh, most likely. Um, but we've had a lot of discussion, and I think this, uh, these awards today, uh, the progress that we've made with Axiom, the progress that we've made with private astronaut missions, uh, the progress that we've made on the demand side, and everything that CASIS is doing, uh, I'm personally uh, hopeful um, that that is making a difference with uh, all of our stakeholders in the administration and Congress and, and the public, uh, that we will, we will do what we plan to do. We're executing on our plans, like we said, and so uh, I'm hopeful the announcement today uh, just furthers that uh, that confidence. I'll jump in uh, on the second question to industry. Um, so the the remember these are uh, funded space act agreements for public private partnerships, and so our development programs are um, commercial business cases. And so I doubt that any of the competitors are going to directly answer your question about development cost. Um, however, what I will say, uh, same thing I said uh, when we announced Orbital Reef in Dubai, um, it much more, much better than an order of magnitude less than what it costs to develop the International Space Station. And there are multiple reasons for that, not least of which is something that's been 
mentioned already in this call, which is that we're not starting from scratch. We're standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, and most of, if not all, of the problems that or the challenges that need to be worked to have a commercial LEO destination uh, have already been solved by the International Space Station program. So that's, that's the explanation for why we can develop a commercial space station for so much less than it cost NASA the first time. And I'd follow on with Brent. I didn't get unmuted quick enough before, but um, Brent's right. Uh, we have already in, uh, invested a lot of work in a lot of our infrastructure so far. Um, we already have, for instance, that large integrated flexible environment uh, or life module. Um, it's already developed. It's already full scale. It's sitting down at KSD, uh, Kennedy Space Center, and the space station processing facility. We've already undergone a lot of testing on it. So certainly not starting from scratch there. We've already put a lot of internal uh, investment into that, as well as the Dream Chaser, obviously, um, and it will fly. We have a window at the end of next year, starting in November, which will go through February of 2023, and, and that's our first maiden launch of Dream Chaser. So obviously well into development and almost ready to you know, get it into its environmental testing prior to shipment down to Florida. So um, already a lot of investment made, a lot of, will continue to be made, but I agree with Brent, we, we can't really go into those numbers. Boy, at the uh, risk of sounding uh, redundant here, this is Jeff Manber. Um, I'll, I'll approach, uh, I'll be evasive, uh, Eric, from a different angle uh, and say that, um, you know, one of the reasons why we're so pleased to be uh, partnering with uh, Lockheed is the investments that they've made in the inflatable uh, technologies as well as so many other things that Lockheed brings to the table. At Nanorax, we, we look at, uh, you know, the two decades of understanding the uh, commercial LEO marketplace. Um, we got, um, you know, ahead of us a uh, period of doing the trades, looking at, you know, who, who are the remaining members of our team and, and how do we do the, contra you know, how do we work the contributions um, and our first initial customers. So, yeah, this, it, it's premature now to, to give you a, a, a price and a cost, et cetera. So um, I'll just echo what everyone is saying here, that it's a, it's a, it's a positive work in progress. So thank you. Rick Mastracchio from Northrop. Yeah, it's hard to say at this early stage. It's part of what phase one is all about. And we will determine the exact cost because there, there are still many major trades to make. And again, the commercial market, the cost is going to be driven by the commercial market, what the market is asking for. Uh, so that will be part of it. And, and like everybody says, it's going to be obviously much lower cost than the International Space Station, much lower operating costs uh, than the International State Space Station, only because the uh, so much effort has been done uh, by, uh, by Northrop Grumman and, and many other companies involved in the space station. Okay, thank you all. Our next question comes from Michael Sheets of CNBC. Hey everybody, appreciate you uh, doing this press conference. I have a question for Phil on the cost side of things. Obviously, these are initial development contracts, and you know, great to have the 400 million to seed the conceptual development. But uh, over the cost, the life of the program, how much does uh, NASA expect to try to contribute uh, as these programs uh, evolve over, you know, to op an operational status? And my second question is for Rick, which is all these other guys they got. Star Lab, Orbital Reef, uh, you, do you guys have a fun nickname for your station over at Northrop Grumman? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, and I think I'll echo what Rick said in the previous question, which is that's what phase one is all about, uh, Michael. I think it's part of what phase one is all about, is to figure out what those um, future uh, full costs are going to be. Um, what percentage of that NASA is going to be. Uh, you know, I have some guesses, but they're just guesses at this point. And that's the whole reason why we didn't sort of rush into a services contract right now. Uh, we felt like it would be premature. Um, while the companies aren't starting from scratch, they're, you know, they're not close to being finished either. We still have several years of development, and I'll, there's still a lot of technical challenges that they're going to have to overcome. And as Rick said, a lot of trades that have to be made, which will um, – 
which will alter the costs going forward. And a lot of decisions have to be made about the specific technical configurations that haven't been made yet. So uh, I would just say TBD, I don't have any definitive answers, and that's what phase one is all about, is to help refine uh, both the um, cost side of the equation, but also the market side of the equation. I'd like to see a couple more years of um, cases doing its activities, some of these commercial opportunities that we've announced on the ISS. We've seen some um, traction on uh, marketing and other activities that since we've expanded the use of ISS. And I think we need a few more years of that to uh, see how that evolves and how that plays in. And we think by the mid part of the decade, that's when we will be able to make definitive decisions. And that's why we've uh, done this two-phase strategy that we've, that we've done. Okay, and uh, this is Rick, and that's a great question, uh, Michael, about what's uh, our space station name going to be. And uh, all I could say is we have several under consideration right now, and uh, we're hoping we'll release something pretty soon here. Thanks. All right, well, stay tuned for more news on that. The next question is from Irene Klotz of Aviation Week. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, for uh, Bill, is it NASA's intention to retain the um, transportation contracts for crew and cargo in the commercial destination era? And uh, separately for Rick, are there any plans to upgrade Cygnus for a crew? Thanks for crew launches. Yeah, Irene, I'll say uh, for this phase, we did request that the bidders propose end-to-end -end commercial LEO destination concepts, including transportation. However, we haven't determined the final transportation requirements for phase two at this time, uh, so we may fold it in to the phase two contracts or we may continue to purchase it uh, separately. Regardless of how it gets contracted, uh, the NASA astronauts will be transported to and from commercial destinations on NASA certified crew transportation systems. Uh, so the commercial crew program has got a long and prosperous life uh, ahead of it because uh, they are going to continue to need to do the kinds of things that they're doing. How we do the actual contracting is, uh, is sort of TBD. Uh, as you guys know, currently SpaceX is currently certified to transport crew. Uh, we expect Boeing to receive certification soon, and there may be other certified systems uh, by the time the commercial destinations are operational. So uh, that's where we stand on that. Okay, and hi, Irene. Uh, good question about Cygnus. We are constantly upgrading Cygnus. We're making it, we're increasing the interior volume. We're adding additional capabilities, external reboost to space station, et cetera. And we've been doing that for many years. And we are, will continue to upgrade Cygnus to support commercial destination and, and, and any, anybody's commercial destination. But no, there's no uh, expectation that Cygnus will carry crew members. Um, would you be able to say, you and also Jeff, what transportation companies you proposed in your um, in your projects? Oh, uh, this is Jeff. Um, we're working uh, we're working the trades. We have a couple of opportunities, and I think it was Phil who said, um, or one of one of the folks who said, you know, we have some time here to work all this out. Um, and so we're in discussion with a few of the folks, but you can work backwards, uh, Irene, and figure out who the logical players are. But no, we're not ready yet to uh, sign a launch uh, contract at this time. That will be in a little bit of time. Yeah, and from Rick, same thing. We, you know, we've talked to the obvious uh, crew, uh, crew transport providers, Boeing and SpaceX, but uh, no uh, agreements or final decisions have been made. Thank you. Thanks, Irene. Uh, the next uh, question comes from Wired. I believe it's Ramin. Yes, that's right. Uh, thank you all for doing this press conference. Um, I, I have a, uh, a practical question. Um, I hope it's not a dumb question, but, but, but something that's not very clear to me. This, this is for uh, the, the, the three uh, company representatives especially. Um, something that's not clear to me is, is how is it going to work with, um, you know, having the, the ability to have science operations that, you know, the science activities, the experiments that uh, are traditionally done on the ISS, especially with, you know, not just NASA, but all of the international uh, uh, partners, as well as um, you know, I'm, I'm presumably there will be, you know, at some point frequently, uh, uh, you know, space tourists visiting 
Um, and maybe eventually, like by 2040, maybe there'll be two there at one time. So, I mean, is it is it going to be like, uh, um, I, I'm trying to picture it, you know, like with some of these like multiple modules where there'll be one module that's sort of like the more tourist side, I guess like a mini hotel. And then on another side, you know, with, with um, uh, experiments and everything like that, and maybe a, um, a shared kitchen or something. I, I'm just, I just want to be able to picture this, how, how this will work. Yeah, so this is this is Brand at Blue Origin. I'll go first. Um, that, that's not a dumb question at all. It's it's actually a very pertinent question, and uh, it gets at the essence of why we consider our concept as uh, or designing it as a mixed use business park, um, which you know any mixed use development on Earth um, finds a way through architecture to blend disparate functions um, or even you know, mutually incompatible functions like retail and residential and industrial and so forth. Um, and so the our answer to your question is uh, what we call our zoned architecture um, that does exactly what you suggest. Uh, it separates habitation from laboratory uh, in different modules. Um, so, you know, one of our ground rules <laughs> from the beginning is you don't sleep in the lab. Um, on our space station, and that that's a sort of a, uh, a brief statement, but it's emblematic of how, as markets develop for more diverse applications, other industrial applications, media, entertainment, advertising, sports, and so forth, um, not just tourism, how those activities will be able to be reconciled. Um, the easiest thing to imagine is essentially a dormitory where uh, all the habitation functions like exercising and eating and uh, socializing and sleeping occur separate from laboratory functions or manufacturing functions. Um, but that same zoned approach uh, applies to other applications as well. Hey, this is Jeff Manber. Look, if there's uh, anything we learned in the past uh, uh, 10 or 15 years of working on the International Space Station, in my view, is that, you know, there'll never be another ISS. There'll never be that type of uh, space station uh, with multiple users um, next in proximity next to each other. Um, you know, as your question implies, you don't want to, you know, an astronaut on a bicycle uh, next to folks who were there to, for a uh, little Zen solitude. Um, and, and so at uh, Starlab, you know, what we're focused on initially is the George Washington Copper uh, Science Park. Um, I believe it's personally, I personally believe it's important as a spacefaring nation that we focus on uh, manufacturing, research, professional as astronauts, um, developing the technology and the skill set to go on to Mars one day. Um, and so uh, I do believe that uh, within the decade there will be different platforms for different market niches. Um, you know, we will have a hotel or two. We will have um, uh, uncrewed. We will have, um, uh, as we are focused on research and in space manufacturing. Um, and so I think it's very exciting, and your question is spot on, uh, that we should not, uh, in our view, try and be everything at once uh, for all the markets, uh, because this is an emerging marketplace, and you really have to specialize in uh, the things that you know best. So thank you. And uh, Rick, Mr. Accio here again. I think that all three of us seem to be saying the very similar things. And, and like like them, our design is is modular. Uh, there, there'll be, of course, there's going to be the facilities and systems that, that provide the space station and the crew power and and life support and things like that. And there's gonna be science labs, there's gonna be the opportunity for dedicated habitation modules, there's gonna be the opportunity for cupolas and windows for earth observations. And, and again, I, I agree with everything everybody else is saying in that uh, it's, there's gonna to have to be a certain level of separation for these things, but it's also gonna be driven, and I keep saying it, it's gonna to have to be driven by the market. And that's what we're gonna be doing I know that Northrop Grumman is going to be concentrated on that uh, heavily, especially in the first year, to really determine what the markets are and then design towards those markets. And But that flexibility to add other capabilities as the market evolves. Thank you. Thanks, okay, great. Thank you all. Uh, and we have one question from Marcia Smith of Space Policy Online. 
Thanks so much. I think my question is mostly for Robin, if she's still on the line, but the companies may want to comment on it as well. Uh, Robin, you talked about the status of negotiations with the White House and Congress about extending ISS to 2030, but could you bring us up to date on the negotiations with the partners and especially with Russia? Is everybody on board for some future date, 2028, 2030? And as part of that, I'm curious, what happens to the partners in this transition? Is it basically a free-for-all and each of them has to figure out where they're gonna go after ISS is no more? You know, Do they have to negotiate with, with each of these three companies? Can they decide to go to China to keep doing their research? Is the US gonna offer any incentives for them to do their research on US platforms instead of somebody else's platforms? How is all of that gonna work out? Yeah, sure. Um, so the status of our partners back in July, I think we finalized it in September, all of our International Space Station international partners uh, at the space agency level um, signed a statement that, that supported uh, extending the ISS to 2030. Um, you know, everyone has to go work within their own governments and their own government processes, you know, to, uh, and timelines. Uh, for that to be official, but at the space agency level, uh, all the partners have, have indicated their support. And frankly, they're kind of waiting for the U.S. to go first. Uh, regarding how is it going to work um, on these commercial space stations, we have actually kicked off uh, discussions with our space station international partners to start talking about that. And we, it's very important to us to keep all of our international partners together um, with this, in this transition from ISS to these commercial space stations. The model, how is it going to work, could be, um, it, it's kind of wide open right now. We're first trying to, to find out what their long-term needs are <clears throat> in low Earth orbit we're, we, as we've been refining our own uh, needs. We're trying to find out what they're interested in and then talk about, you know, what sort of arrangement uh, would work out. So uh, very important to us, very important to our administration, and uh, our partners are excited to start talking about that with us. Thanks. And does anyone from the companies have anything to say as to whether you're approaching uh, the uh, ISS partners as part of your market research? Well, this is Janet Cavandi. I can say for sure that for Orbital Reef, uh, we've already been in connect, contact with uh, several of the international partners, the, the actual agencies and the sub-agencies. For instance, ESA has DLR. The ESA, the European Space Agency, has a DLR, which is the German Space Agency. We are talking at all levels as well as to individual companies, right? Since this is going to be a commercial space station, eventually we're going to be, you know, making products and doing research with other companies. Um, and so I think over time it will probably evolve and we will have not only a, you know, a government or civil service sector that uses um, Orbital Reef or these other commercial stations, but also, you know, commercial and, and maybe other applications of some of these space stations, and there, there may be more than one. Uh, so, yes, to answer your question, we are in contact. Uh, there are negotiations, negotiations are going on, and there's a lot of excitement about the, the future in low Earth orbit for these other countries. Hey, this is uh, Jeff Manver here. Uh, Masha, I mean, your, your question is perceptive, but the, 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 I don't know if I want to use the word business model, but the, the, the way we're operating in LEO has been changing slowly but definitively for the last decade. And I can recall the, the, um, the questions when uh, NASA launched commercial cargo. Uh, we all probably recall the questions when commercial crew was launched. Uh, it's a different way of operating, and it's a more efficient way and terribly exciting. Uh, and I think the space agencies uh, are trying to understand it uh, fully. Um, they're beginning to see the value in the conversations that we've had. They're beginning to see the value of working with it, and we all share. Everybody on this call shares the understanding and belief that the partnership and in, international partnership in general must stay together. 
uh, and um, and so I, I have full confidence that it will. Um, but this is a period of transition. This is where it's changing how we operate in Leo from the moment uh, of conceiving a payload to launching it, operating it, where you operate it, how you operate it. Uh, we're really moving into the final stages of being an emerging marketplace. So that's that. And Rick Mastracchio here, I agree with uh, Jeff. This certainly is a period of transition. And uh, to answer the question directly, yes, we're talking to international partners. But I do think that uh, there's going to be a lot of discussion with uh, NASA and, uh, and how to best uh, implement this. And it, is it going to be a free-for-all or is there going to be something a little more organized? Thanks so much. Thank you all. Uh, we do have a hard stop at 6 o'clock, uh, so we'll take one last question, and hopefully we can have uh, succinct answers to finish off the course. So, Joey Roulette from the New York Times, your question. Hey, thanks for taking my question. Um, I have a question for all the company representatives that I hope um, you guys can answer in some, in some way or another, but how did you guys arrive at the bid prices that NASA is funding here, and, and how does that compared to what you're privately investing into these stations. And I guess, for example, for Blue Origin and Sierra Space, you were awarded you know, $130 million here. Is that similar to what you're investing or what you plan to invest overall privately? Or is that you know, a significant chunk of the money that it's going to take to build these, you know, the, the space station? Um, thanks. So uh, this is Brent uh, from Blue Origin. The, the, um, the awards uh, that NASA's made in the uh, through funded space action agreements are um, for specific uh, aspects of developing the design. Uh, so as Phil said at the beginning, uh, there are uh, test milestones and um, uh, program development milestones, and that's basically what NASA is purchasing here. Um, in a very real sense, the money that uh, NASA has available today and is able to invest to get this program started is uh, small compared to what will be required to um, develop stations to uh, PDR and then CDR and, um, you know, through test and, and launch. And that's, um, that's indicative of our collective belief in the value of public-private partnership and the value of the commercial marketplace. And I know we're running out of time. This is Jeff here. Um, look, NASA provided us uh, uh, and all of us with initial seed funding. Uh, one of the roles of Voyager Space will be to go out and, into the capital markets and uh, raise uh, uh, the, the majority of the capital. It's still said at the onset uh, of this uh, call. Um, the private sector, all of us here are, are contributing the majority of the funds. And uh, NASA is providing the credibility uh, the stamp of approval and the initial seed funding. And so that's terribly important. And it's very important we're in a time with financial markets supporting activities like this. Thank you. And from Rick Mastracchio, uh, again, echoing this, this is initial commitment and initial funding. And of course, Nat, uh, Northrop Grumman committed to a certain amount of money during the, uh, uh, for this development stage. However, we're not stopping there. We're continuing to look for ways to reduce costs to NASA through partnerships and commercial opportunities and other avenues. And so that will be an evolving story over the next uh, few years. Um, and this is Brent again. I just wanted to add, um, let's, let's also not forget that the other value of Space Act agreements is access to NASA experts. Um, and so it's not just money. It's not just about, um, you know, what we would call revenue in the commercial world. It's also about um, partnering on a, uh, technically with um, experts across the agency who know about space stations and the systems required and, and how to operate them and all of that. That's incredibly important to all of us. Great addition. Thank you. Thank you all for your questions. And thank you for the briefers who took the time today to provide remarks and tell us about their proposals and answer questions. This teleconference has been recorded. If you'd like to replay the conference, you can access it by dialing 800-867-1931 or listen to it on the YouTube link. And for more information about NASA's efforts to build a robust low-Earth orbit economy, please visit nasa.gov forward slash 
leo-economy. Thank you for joining us tonight, and have a great evening. That concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may disconnect at this time. Speakers, please stand by for your post-conference.